So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to try finally to give some substance to the uh, elusive uh, monkey data that uh, you've heard about but uh, never seen. So here it is. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some work that I did uh, as a postdoc actually quite a long time ago and some work uh, that I'm doing now in uh, Lyon um, where I work at the CNRS. So, so my background is actually quite different from uh, other people's background because uh, I actually first started studying uh, philosophy, then I switched to uh, psychology and then to experimental psychology, and then finally <laughs> I'm a neurophysiologist. And uh, what I uh, really try to do is uh, try to provide at a systemic level that is within a uh, brain area uh, to understand what are the uh, functional properties of neurons, how they compute information, and how this is uh, affected uh, by learning and memory. And uh, so uh, I try to do that, and I do that in a monkey. And uh, uh, here I listed some of the questions that uh, uh, Simon has uh, posted on the first day. And those are the questions that I'm going to, that my work tries to address, which is, um, can we see learning in the firing rate of neurons? Uh, are memories encoded at the same time in the hippocampus and in the cortex? So that relates to the uh, consolidation. Do, you, do I need that or not? Do I need that? <laughs> no, but tell me because uh, uh, it's better. Okay. So uh, this relates to the uh, consul. Well, if I speak like that, then you can't hear it. So. <laughs> uh, this relates to the. Uh, um, notion of uh, consolidation that has also been uh, uh, talked about. Uh, then is uh, familiar information encoded in the hippocampus? Can we still see something in the hippocampal neuron once uh, this um, once um, information is really well known? And uh, finally, I'll talk about some uh, recent work on uh, the idea of uh, concept cells coded in the monkey brain. And I uh, approach that through uh, cross-modal associations in the monkey. So, um, as I said, I do all this work in the monkey, and uh, um, I uh, first wanted to uh, do something which is kind of uh, unorthodox, but uh, talk a little bit about uh, the uh, use of uh, animal models in research. So, uh, especially because this is really a cont controversial um, thing recently, there's more and more um, activists that actually drive the politics away from the uh, use of animal <coughs> models. But uh, I just wanted to explain something that animal models actually bring. So one thing is that they allow multi-scale analysis. So you can go from microscopic scale in which you have organization of uh, molecules to uh, organization of uh, population of uh, cells that form an organ, but also an individual. And this is really important in obvious clinical areas where, you know, like in cancer research, where you have to have a whole uh, individual to actually uh, visualize cells that, by definition, move across organs. So you can't use only uh, organ by itself. You really have to map out how the, develop the development of cancer. In uh, um, areas like cardiac surgeries, then you need to test your devices in a whole individual to know whether that works. Uh, Parkinson disease is one of the uh, um, area that really showed how um, actually somehow like neuropsychology, experimental psychology in the monkey actually allowed to understand the uh, um, uh, motor functions of the basal ganglia and that how led um, to the um, treatment of Parkinson's, which is through a uh, uh, deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus. So um, all of these examples are actually really clinical examples. But one point I'd like to, to, to do is that it's uh, um, even the most moderate of the uh, uh, animal activists would actually want 
that uh, research using animal is only clinical. But we can't really do that because we can't predict in advance how uh, the research that we're doing is actually going to be used. So research with a pure and direct medical goal cannot be the only motivation to use uh, animal um, models because uh, the medical advances are actually the result of a uh, progressive uh, acquisition in uh, um, knowledge. And then also when we do animal research, we do it in a regulated framework in that um, we um, apply, so this is the three R's, so this is a, a principles in which we apply refinement, reduction and replacement, and we only use um, animal if we cannot replace it by anything else. Okay, so that said, the type of uh, um, animal model that we use, you know, there's lots of um, models that we can use, but uh, here this is the phylogenetical scale with separation by million uh, years, and actually between the mouse and the human there's quite a gap. So uh, I chose to work on the macaque, which is here, which is phylogenetically closer to us. It's, uh, um, there's not many macaques that are used in uh, medical research and they're used for various domains and, of course, in neuroscience. So, for example, we use macaques, like what we do here, decipher the signals underlying movement, emotions and memory, understand the evolution of cognitive functions. So, uh, uh, I think there's a lot that we can understand by identifying what is uh, really uh, specific to human with respect to uh, um, to other species, and uh, of course we use animals to understand and treat neurological and psychiatric disease and develop innovating approaches like a brain-machine interface. Um, so on the behavioral level, macaques are really interesting uh, animals because they're uh, in many ways very close to us. So they have very complex societies that um, work with a highly level, uh, high level of uh, hierarchy. And the hierarchy is uh, um, more or less flexible, but one interesting thing is that the hierarchy is transmitted uh, culturally from like uh, daughters, um, from mothers to daughters. And um, they use sophisticated behavior. There's been some evidence that they can use rudimentary tools, of course, but uh, this is an example of uh, them using various uh, rocks to open uh, shells, um, yeah, shells in, uh, on an island. And then the other thing that is, uh, to me, the most important thing is that their way to apprehend the world is actually really similar to the way we apprehend the, the world, which is through vision. And what I posted here is the way a macaque explores a uh, uh, face, a macaque face, when he tries to identify the uh, uh, individual that is presented here. And this is the pattern, so overlaid here, the, the patches are the pattern of exploration of uh, um, that the animal makes. And you can yeah. see that he looks at the um, eye region, and this is a human um, examining another human, and this is very similar. They use the uh, uh, same kind of strategies. Okay, so uh, at the level of the brain, so the macaque, you know, is, uh, I mean, if we distinguish between um, mammals, I mean, there's the uh, well-known expansion of neocortex, but this is really a marker uh, for um, primates. And uh, here I just underlined and uh, made bigger the macaque brain compared to the human brain. Uh, you can see that the organization between the two is very similar. And, uh, um, you know, compared to the mouse brain, I mean, the macaque also has the uh, folds that account for the uh, expansion of the neocortex. Uh, now we go to the um, organization so, uh, of the connections. So Rodrigo yesterday gave this uh, brutal, um, uh, <laughs> brutal schematics with like 100 of uh, um, connections going to the hippocampus. So I'm giving the simpler version that was uh, in a review by Howard Eichenbaum. And uh, uh, here it shows that the uh, organization is pretty much the same in rodent and primate, but one of the things that's different for primates is that, again, the, the 
hippocampal region here receives really um, projections from neurocortical regions such as the parietal cortex, the temporal cortex, which are the regions that code the location of uh, things and the um, uh, identity of things. So that is the uh, what and where. And that I think is really important um, uh, uh, important criteria to use the uh, uh, macaque brain. Um, so one slide that I've uh, thrown in uh, since uh, uh, yesterday and, and uh, this morning's talk is uh, to provide kind of like numbers of cells because we've talked a lot about how many cells could uh, um, support a memory and how many cells were there in the um, in the, um, the hippocampus, and that shows. So one thing that I was uh, that I thought is interesting is that despite the fact that uh, the actual the human brain is uh, one thousand times bigger than the rat brain, and you just have to trust me for that, and it's ten times bigger <laughs> than the monkey brain, um, there's actually not a, such an expansion in the number of neurons. The volume is bigger, but that also accounts for these massive projections within the uh, hippocampus. <coughs> One other thing that I thought was interesting is that um, there's different um, <coughs> ratios of increases across the ratio of increase across the different regions is different. So if we look here uh, for the CA3, which is where those recurrent collaterals are, there's uh, uh, 11 times more cells in the human compared to the rat. Um, but many more in the dentate, which receive uh, the uh, uh, neocortical information, and even more actually in the uh, uh, CA1, which will project back to uh, uh, the cortex. So um, with respect, and maybe I didn't understand that well, but I thought uh, this is shown in a different way again. But with respect with uh, uh, Heinz talk this morning, where we were thinking about the storage capacity, which is the product between the synapses and the number of cells. Here we have, we may have a hint that this might be uh, there's a huge gain of the number of neurons that you can put into the vectors of neurons. But I'm just throwing this in, maybe I didn't get it right, and uh, uh, this is for discussion. But you, you, you have, can you tell us about the, the change in the number of connections per neuron? Yeah, so um, that actually I didn't search. So I think there, it, there is more, maybe someone knows here. Do you, do you know, Edmund, if there is more? Um, it's a crucial question, and uh, I've asked lots of anatomists. They say they can't get money to do straight anatomy nowadays, but it's a crucial question. We want to know. I suspect it's about 20 or 30,000, which would put the storage capacity to about 20 or 30,000 memories. So, okay. Okay, so um, is the uh, monkey a good model for the uh, human brain? So I think it's a, a pretty good model in that it has similarities and we can also learn from the differences. So now I'm finally going to get to the core <laughs> of the research, which is uh, the first uh, study I'm going to present. It's uh, kind of like an old study, but uh, addresses that first question, which was how does the activity of the neurons uh, change directly, or do we, can we identify a change of, in the activity of the neurons um, related to the learning? And so the kind of uh, learning that I'm talking about here is a uh, uh, learning that is typical from the uh, uh, hippocampus, which links uh, things within things. So uh, let me explain. So if I have a picture here of uh, a lion on sort of like a pedestal here, uh, the, for, for me, for my memory, actually, the way I can recall this, uh, maybe somebody recognizes this, but uh, for me, the way I can actually, or I, I know where that uh, line belongs to, is actually that last year I visited Venice and I saw the uh, San Marco Cathedral and then I can quote that this line is actually uh, on the top of the uh, um, cathedral in, in Venice. And this type of memory has been shown um, by many lesion studies that to be really dependent on the hippocampus. So uh, here we call it location scene task, but Edmund would call it spatial view um, task. 
Um, so the way we do the, um, and so this is the kind of task that I'm going to, that I'm going to use. Uh, the way we do our experiments is that we place a uh, chamber on top of uh, fixed on the, um, on the skull of the monkey and we lower electrodes and those chambers remain for a few years. We can take them out actually after uh, when we don't need them anymore, but every day we'll lower electrode here. Um, to our target here, which is the hippocampus. Another little uh, point here, and I think I really like that slide, and that's, I mean, you should look at that slide. So, <laughs> so um, we've been talking about the dark matter or the, uh, so, and the um, point of that slide that's uh, made by Bujaki is uh, um, uh, he provided, again, like numbers, uh, so this is an electrode, and you can see here they, they made an estimate of the number of neurons that one could record from in a radius of uh, um, 50 microns. And in that case, it's 140 neurons. And the thing is that when you lower your electrode, you actually don't record 140 uh, neurons. As Simon said, we only get actually maybe two, three. I mean, in that case, you know, I show you some. You can't see well, but believe me, they're well identified. <laughs> this is my noise, and this is cluster one, two, and three. So if we have, you know, a few cells, we're really happy, and then there is, we, we do know that there are all these cells that actually we can't, we, we don't know, and maybe we don't stimulate them with the right stimulus, but uh, they're there. So, in other words, um, electrophysiology is an undersampling of uh, what is happening, and uh, um, replication is actually important to um, get to the bottom of um, the computations or what the neurons do. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you a uh, trial of um, the task that we've been using in, those, uh, uh, in that first study. So the monkey has to uh, fixate a, um, a point on the, on the screen. After a while, there's a scene that comes on the screen. It's just an image and uh, the monkey has to keep fixating and what he knows is that he'll have to make an eye movement to one of these targets. So this is this uh, uh, location scene task, this association between a target and only one of the targets here will lead to reward. And so he'll be able to make this eye movement only once the fixation point comes out and there's a little delay here that will bind the um, actual uh, scene to the uh, uh, actual movement. So in that case, let's say that the eye movement to the west target is actually rewarded, and then the monkey gets reward directly into his mouth, actually. It's a uh, liquid juice. So um, we give these scenes to the monkeys to learn concurrently. So one thing that we do is that uh, we actually artificially slow down the rate of learning when we did the experiment because we thought that we wouldn't see anything if the learning was too fast. And so we gave the monkeys multiple scenes to learn at the same time. So on one trial, they would see one, one uh, image and the next trial would be the other image. And then we'd construct learning curves for each of these individual scenes. And then they were also intermixed with other scenes that uh, the monkeys would often know, that they were familiar. So uh, here, what I represent here is the activity of one neuron to three new scenes. So this is, yeah? So, so can we go back? I, yeah. I want to understand the task again. Okay. So the, 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 scene, the original scene is uh, up there, and then yeah. what is the task then? Yeah, so on one trial, I'll do uh, this whole thing with one scene. Then the trial two, I'll give a different scene. So... Um, trial one, what would be the task? What would so trial one is, I fixate here, a scene appears, the scene comes up, and I have to guess and learn through trial and error which of the targets here will be will give me reward if I make the correct the, the eye movement towards that target. But there was the was I'm confused. Mm -hmm. There is a relation between the scene and just the in the scene there are the cues or not? No, so what they'll do is that they'll, uh, on one trial, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll make an eye movement here. It may be correct or incorrect. Let's say like the first trial, they make the, the 
eye movement here will be incorrect, so they know it's not the east target. The next trial, they make the eye movement towards the north. And so it's more of a, uh, there's no clue about those targets. It's kind of like a, a uh, way to make an association between that scene and a correct target location. So this is what they have to do. They have to make an association between the visual scene here and a movement to one of the targets. Yeah? No, you don't get it. I don't understand what the role of the image. Oh, <laughs> if there's no image, if there's no image, they will never know which target is rewarded. So there is an association between that image for the monkey scene, the gorilla scene, the eye movement. So, does it see the marks? I see here marks on the image. So, so the targets are here. Okay, so is the what target without an image? No, uh, oh, but we give different images. So trial one, there is this image and it's associated to this target. Trial two, I'll learn a different image which is associated to a different target. So I'll have... So, so I get trial one, I mean it's like you know Jennifer Aniston and the White House, Jennifer Aniston, no not Jennifer, uh, Julia Roberts and uh, Eiffel Tower. So you could think of, of these as four different locations and each image here has its own location that is rewarded. So if I take away the images, yeah? What's the problem? Well, no, but then, yeah. well, then what, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna look at is the activity during the image. No, forget about the activity, I'm talking about the task. Yeah. I don't, don't understand the task. But he will never get rewarded because there'll be a random. No, no. So I think the, I I I okay. the question, the, the question is much more basic. Yeah. The task is association of an image with location. Yeah. That's correct? Yeah. yeah. So you associate an image with location. Then you see the image, you know which location to go. So, so, so before, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So, so here, so here I show you this image. There are four targets. You don't know which one is rewarded. The first trial, you're gonna make a guess. You'll go like, okay, I'll try here. Wrong, it was not the right target. So you don't get any rewards. The next trial, I present the target again, the, the image again, and then you don't wanna make the eye movement to the same target because you didn't get any rewards. So you'll switch, you'll go to a different target. And then... But I could do it with the next screen. No, you wouldn't be able no, to so do it with the next screen. So the next time they will have something like that, then you learn to look after that, the reward. So, so later on the gorilla comes, not yes. coming, not, not, not crossing. Before, before he makes the uh, eye movement, the gorilla comes, such that... It wasn't in your slide, that's really understand. Well, this is one trial, okay. This is, okay, this is a real trial, okay? So I'm a monkey here, uh, okay. So T1, there's the, uh, if everybody talks, please Yadin, if everybody, if everybody talks that I, I can't cover it. So, um, so this is T1 in my trial, okay? So I fixate this. T2, the gorilla image comes. T3, it goes away. T4, I make an eye movement. I'm instructed by the image Toward to which, which target to go. So I learn by making multiple times this, uh, those trials which target I should go depending on which image was presented. So if I don't have any, right? Do you, yeah? Okay. okay. You, you're, I'm sure you're not convinced, but maybe we can. Uh, <coughs> Okay. Okay, yeah. So you train the Swiss monkeys uh, that long as if they perform like 90% or something, 95%? No, I think so before, like. Okay, I'll go here then. Okay. So, so for each uh, image, in the beginning, there are a chance. Chance would be zero, you know, 25. And then with uh, um, trials repeating, then they finally get it, and this is a uh, probability correct based on the uh, actual animal's response, a logistic regression. So uh, 
they uh, uh, you know, make errors, then they finally get it, and once they get it, they uh, uh, usually uh, perform correctly. So the thing we're gonna look at here is uh, uh, I'm showing the activity to three images. So that would be like showing the activity to Jennifer Aniston, uh, Julia Roberts, and uh, Brad Pitt, for example. And those, I had three on each, on, on, uh, um, during my task, I had on some trials, uh, the gorilla scene, on another trial I had another scene, and then, uh, and then so on. So what this neuron does is just a visual discrimination. It's not a visual discrimination because it actually does discriminate between the three types of trial during the delay time. So what I'm going to do here is try to understand what happens here. So this is a cell that prefers the gorilla image, where it responds at the end of the gorilla presentation and then it stays up, whereas it doesn't really respond to the other images. Yeah, I heard, yeah? Um, can you go on? Uh, yeah. So is there, um, can the monkey already make the saccade no. right? During the image or right after? No, what no, no. Is there we'll like a maintenance them. that is required? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so if he uh, if he makes his saccade here, it's too early and the trial is aborted. So he has to uh, maintain fixation here, and then he can only make. Uh, and there was seven hundred so milliseconds like delay. Preparation, basically. Yeah. So yeah, you can. Yeah. So it's not motor, and I'll show you why it's not completely motor in a second. Yeah. Why don't you usually use like? Uh, that the monkey has to do something else. I don't know. I just think that for me, eye movement is a thing that's very hard to control. Like, I don't know, when I look at something, I automatically, I don't know, my eyes just go. Yeah, like, so, there, so there's really tons of literature that has been showing all the visual stuff. They, we, we place them in front of monitors and they learn to uh, fixate. And, um, you know, even in like the Kiroga thing, they were looking at images, right? And they, they're not being distracted, they process it. And so they learn, we, we, they, we train them to do that. So they do that uh, perfectly. And lots of people have been doing that, not only, uh, not only me. Uh, there's a, yeah? Uh, the, the recording of um, which region? Oh, sorry, so I recorded in the hippocampus here. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah? What is the activity of the same neuron without the scene? So if the monkey just makes the saccade to the same location, is there any Only, scene? okay, so I'll, I'll, move, I'll move on, because, uh, um, so there, so now I'm looking at the activity of the cell, uh, what I did here is only look at the activity of the cell during that delay period. And instead of looking at the trial frame, what I'm showing here is as a function of the trial number in the session. So before the animal learned that activity was actually quite low, after the animal learned, we have an increase in the uh, firing rate here. So um, you could think, think that it's actually just a motor preparation, right? And this is what you're hinting. And uh, we know this is not the case because, uh, as I showed you before, I intermixed other uh, trials with other with uh, um, with uh, familiar scenes for which the same movement was actually associated. So this is the activity of that same cell to a different image that is also associated to the north target. And the activity here is not, um, remains flat. So it's really linking that one scene, scene with the eye movement towards that location. So here, yeah, yeah. Whether, uh, right, so the hypothesis here is that this activity here represents the association between the image that I have shown and the eye movement towards that location because this is what leads to reward. So, yeah. So, working memory is occurring here? Working, yeah, yeah. So, 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 that activity here actually precedes the uh, eye movement, or you could think it follows that. Um, 
Well, it's not working memory because it's something that we then see throughout the whole session. So it's uh, activity that is built from one trial to the other throughout the session. Um, it resembles, I agree, those uh, prefrontal cells where you have a uh, persistent activity. But um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's actually, I don't, I mean, you don't really know how to address that. Uh, if you look here, we look at uh, all the cells that uh, um, we show changes to, and this is uh, as a function of the uh, trial, the time in the trial, and this is the activity before learning and after learning. If it was only uh, working memory, then you'd have it even before learning, whereas we only have it after the animal has learned the association in long-term memory. Right? So if it were just working memory, we would have an uh, uh, activity that would follow the image presentation that would be present here. And uh, what we get actually is a development of an activity uh, after the animal has learned that is, keeps being throughout, present throughout the whole session. But that's the point then, see if he doesn't know. So well, but that's the point. I mean, he keeps in his mind something that is ha about to happen. It's a prediction, right? So the gorilla scene comes, then it's not working memory anymore, right? The gorilla scene comes, I predict that I have to make the eye movement towards the north, and that's my long-term memory. It's not uh, working memory. But, but it could be just repetitions of the visual thing. It could be, why? Why would you say that? I'm just saying you... Because we get... I'm just saying it's not... How do you know that it is the encoding association other than... Right, so it's, it's I agree, so that... So stimulus uh, and a hundred times, it will be... It will generate activity, elevate activity, when I'm sure. Hmm? So, so in... Uh, um, I mean, it's the same... Uh, um, that, well, I agree that it's not causal in that we could not disrupt the, uh, um, you know, these neurons and see how they supported the uh, responses causally. So the, the, the image in a different context of the monkey after learning would you still see this activity or not? We didn't, we didn't do that. What we, what we did was look at the activity uh, to familiar scenes, but I guess that doesn't address your question. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree it's not causal. We don't have a causal link. It's only correlations. So what we show is that there's a, a number of cells that's above chance that changes their firing rates when the animal learns. That's all we have, and we make the hypothesis that it's related to learning. But it's true, it's not causal. Um, yeah. So... Right. So the type of changes that we showed was uh, um, increases in activity, but we also uh, found cells that had decreases in activity. So I'll come that back to that a bit later. Um, this slide is just to show that the whole span of the trial is, uh, uh, shows changes. So here I plotted the uh, um, firing rate as uh, for each cell. This is each row is a cell, and this is their firing rate throughout the time of the um, trial. And this shows that the whole um, time of the trial is actually, changes can ap uh, happen throughout the whole time of the trials. Was the, was the lower row? Sorry? The two lower rows? Okay, so because I had uh, changes that were increases, like this one, and I also had changes that were decreases. So uh, those are cells that showed a um, activity um, that decreased as a function of learning. Yeah. Uh, which fraction of hippocampal uh, single units that are recorded showed such behavior, like either, uh, either increased or decreased? Sorry, I didn't Wait, hear Which that. fraction of uh, hippocampal neurons that right, so showed this kind of feature? 
18% of the cells. And uh, um, so again, it's all those cells that we recorded more, but it's way more than what you'd expect by chance. Uh, I think Rodrigo, in a similar paradigm, you had 40% of cells that changed with learning. And uh, um, here we actually mapped against the whole uh, number of cells. We have uh, 18%. And then, yeah, changes were both increases and decreases. Yeah? Uh, which area of the hippocampus are you? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's, it's really hard to parse the uh, monkey hippocampus if you don't do the histology after. So uh, it's throughout the whole um, dentate, uh, C1, C3, um, yeah. But you haven't thought about doing the histology after? We didn't do the histology after, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, it would be an important point to address. So what is the selectivity of those elevated responses? Okay, so I think that's my point, is that, that um, this, the effect of the changes in firing rate change the way the cells respond to the stimulus. It affects their selectivity. So this is the uh, firing rate of all the uh, pictures that I showed to the monkey before learning, and this is after learning. And so we have an increase of selectivity for these cells. And if we quantify that, so this is another way to look at it. Each line is one of these um, uh, one of these uh, associations, this time throughout seen as a function of the trial number, we used a simple selectivity index that kind of like quantifies the uh, amplitude uh, between the firing rates and uh, we calculated the selectivity index before learning and after learning and we showed that we have an increase of selectivity for um, after learning in the cells that increase their firing rate and a decrease in the cells that decrease their firing rate. So that's the changes in the firing rate result in a uh, change in the way the cells respond to the stimulus that we present. Hmm? Uh, and this is really a uh, maybe <laughs> cartoon for a dummy, but the way I've been thinking about that is that um, if you think of an array of cells, you present pictures, and this is all my cells, and this would be their firing rate before learning to that gorilla scene um, through lateral inhibition and uh, competition, what happens is that we uh, increase the selectivity of some cells that will in turn inhibit it, the uh, activity of, uh, I mean, it's super simple. So, <laughs> um, and then we result, we end up with some cells that become more selective to uh, a specific stimulus in uh, kind of like a sparse way. And in turn, if uh, we show different pictures which have a different set of activity, then you know you get different cells that will be responsive for this, um, those associations like that. And uh, um, this is a picture that I wanted to show, uh, knowing that this is really a su super simple-minded cartoon. Uh, here, again, it's kind of like providing um, actual uh, data. What this um, uh, slide shows, it's also from the Bujaki lab, is the uh, uh, reconstruction of the uh, arborescent, arbor the dendritic tree of one single cell that is located in the CA3. And that soma of the cell is here in green. And you can see here that it does have um, um, dendrites that project or that make uh, connections throughout the whole hippocampus. In yellow here, there's a dentate gyrus. This is CA3, and then, of course, all the output uh, to uh, CA1. But then here, you can see that these, the collaterals the, uh, of this cell project uh, really will make connections throughout the whole hippocampus. And that's just like one cell, so I think it's really a beautiful example of the uh, uh, computations that uh, you can think of, you know, having something like as simple in, in mind, but uh, confronted to the real data. Um, okay. So the next question that I wanted to uh, address is whether these uh, uh, changes are specific to the hippocampus or we can see them in uh, uh, the cortex. So 
you know, as we've been talking before, there's this uh, hypothesis that uh, maybe initial learning happens in the uh, hippocampus and then that um, memories are being transferred in the cortex. So the way uh, in trying to uh, uh, address this question is to record directly when the uh, animal forms a association in the cortex and in the hippocampus, but also to look at whether uh, memories are represented in the hippocampus, or, uh, um, what happens when new memories become old memories. So for the first thing, we uh, record in the perianal cortex. And uh, what we found is that we had exactly the same kind of uh, activity in the perianal cortex than in the hippocampus. So decreasing activity, increasing activities, okay? Um, it was uh, slightly more decreasing activity in the perianal cortex, and that's consistent with repetition suppression also, which may be just the uh, repetition. But the bottom line is that we saw exactly the same kind of changes in the both structures. Um, the other thing that we've been looking at is that maybe if uh, there is a hierarchy between cortex, a uh, hippocampus and cortex, we'd see a difference in the um, timing of the changes in firing rate with respect to the changes uh, to, to learning. So the way we looked at that was by computing for each session the trial at which the animal learn, uh, learn the associations by uh, looking at the, uh, uh, the time when the lower confidence bound crossed the median um, estimate. And we did the same thing for the neural activity and we did that for all the cells that we recorded from. And uh, this is a distribution of these changes with respect to learning in the hippocampus. So this is the trial of behavioral change, trial of neuronal change, and this is in the perianal cortex. And you can see that there's absolutely no difference. So uh, changes in the hippocampus and the cortex, they're actually concurrent, they're uh, simultaneous. The only thing that we found, the only difference that we found is that the perianal cortex had a uh, stronger processing of the uh, visual image compared to the hippocampus. And that's just due to the specialization of uh, uh, this cortex. Um, right, so to wrap up that, um, what happens in the cortex compared to the hippocampus, the changes appear, uh, happen concurrently, suggesting that plasticity uh, happens fast and that neural structures uh, work together. So they, the changes that happen within domains, but um, uh, and in the hippocampus, they spread across domains because we had more activity during the delay period. So. Um, I'm just being really cautious here, but that suggests that long-term consolidation, semantization of memories happen, but um, cortex in, is involved in the, since the start in a parallel encoding in the hippocampus when we do the electrophysiology. Um, okay, so what happens in the hippocampus with time as new memories become old memories? So here I'm going back to this thing that I didn't understand, but on every uh, session, the animal does trials in which he learns associations, but he also has trials during which he um, see or performs associations that he already knows. So those are those reference scenes, and these scenes, they perform them like uh, hundreds of times, and they know those associations very well. So we, recorded, we record for both types of um, um, trials. And uh, when we look, I mean, first thing is that uh, neurons respond to these old associations as well. And when we look at the firing rate, we have no difference between the reference scenes and the new scenes. Um, the next question we, th we uh, asked is that, may, well, maybe if there's no difference in the average firing rate, maybe there's a difference in the way the cells discriminate among the two types of memories. So what we did was, uh, for each cell, look at the way the uh, cell discriminates between familiar scenes and uh, new scenes. And we computed the selectivity index for each of these uh, um, 
category of uh, stimuli. And this is what we found, is that the selectivity indices for the reference scenes, the, uh, um, the um, uh, stimuli that the animal actually really learned, were actually shifted towards a higher selectivity. So the more you knew the uh, uh, associations, the more the cells actually encoded the uh, uh, stimulus with a sharpened selectivity. So uh, the familiar memories were still represented in uh, the hippocampus and the repetition of the memories increased the mechanism that led to this uh, high selectivity. So ask me questions because I have a tendency to really speak loud and uh, I'm not that uh, um, familiar at giving talks so uh, maybe I'm going to finish really earlier. I'm looking at the time. How, how much time do I have? Oh, 10 minutes? Okay, so no, not at all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a second part. As well. Okay, so how about... Uh, <laughs> that was a good reaction. <laughs> well, so, so this was like uh, looking at uh, arbitrary association, but how about more ecological? So now I'm going to like speed up. Uh, <laughs> more ecological information. Uh, and uh, uh, the way we uh, thought of it is that those monkeys, we, so we're working in monkeys that are housed into uh, um, colony rooms. And uh, uh, for them, they don't have that access to um, you know, many stimuli. So we can't really uh, probe our monkeys with thousands of images like like Rodrigo does, because their world is kind of limited. But we thought that maybe the animals uh, have a way to represent other animals through, and here I'm representing a Facebook, so <laughs> I guess that the young generation knows, in which uh, monkeys would actually make an association between individual faces and individual voices. So, um, so the first question, and that actually nobody really addressed, was whether the uh, uh, animals have a representation of others at an individual level, and whether this representation is supported by a multimodal association. So we, uh, yeah, so this is just okay. Um, so we first had to test that at a behavioral level. So what we did was uh, train the animal Okay, so what we did is uh, um, use personally known uh, material to the animals to test them uh, with. So we took pictures of ourselves, like voice excerpts of ourselves, and we tried to see whether the animals could spontaneously, without any learning, make a link between the two. So I'm going to explain. So the way we did that was to first try to get like a framework in which we try to get the animals to do something. So they fixated again, then we played a sound. First, uh, this is just training, this is not testing. So they learn to sit throughout the sound, they still have to fixate, and then we give them two images, and then they just have to learn that they can look at the two images, and no matter what they look at here, they're gonna get reward. So we first train them to do that. And then, and this is when you pray and you hope that nothing is going to happen, you use all the monkeys of the colony room and you test them with your personally familiar material, which were in that case pictures of other monkeys that they know and voices of other calls, actually, the several calls of other monkeys that they knew. And, uh, you know, this is the uh, uh, PhD student that did this, and this is me a few years ago, you can see that. <laughs> and uh, so we used um, pictures and uh, voices of the uh, experimenters. And then we did our actual test. So this is uh, uh, only a few trials where this time, instead of these arbitrary things, we actually play the uh, voice of uh, someone. And after a, a, a delay, we show a picture, uh, two pictures, and one of which here belongs or is the same individual as the uh, voice that was played here. And then we look at eye movements. They're not rewarded, remember that they're not rewarded to do anything specific. They just rewarded to explore. So this is uh, individual trials. 
This is one trial where I said something and then we give, uh, this is uh, uh, one trial where the spatial arrangement was like this. We uh, quantified the, the uh, we, uh, the yellow trace is just the eye movement. This is another trial. And we use the same, the same set uh, then, but preceded by a different uh, voice. So we have trials in which Julia said something and we showed those same pictures. And then we see what happens. And so the critical um, comparison is whether what monkeys are going to do for uh, one picture uh, depending on what is being presented before. And uh, what we see is that they actually orient. So this is just the difference in the, oh, I'm sorry, this is still in French. Actually, I didn't take it from the paper. But um, this is, so it's really small differences, but that were statistically significant across all monkeys in that they spent more time looking at the individual to uh, uh, whose voice was played just before. So uh, they did that uh, for um, monkey stimuli and they did that for human stimuli. So this is not the first saccade or something? This is the gate well, we, the first saccade was the same thing. So this is the whole time, but if we used only the first saccade, they did our actually orient towards the, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the right individual. Okay, so uh, the macaques are able to link vocal identity to face identity uh, of personally known uh, individuals. So now that we had that, we thought we're going to look at what happens in the brain with this type of material. And um, so we recorded it in the, um, the lower bank of uh, STS uh, and in the hippocampus and using uh, personally familiar images. So those are all <laughs> images of things that the monkey know, have seen, and uh, non-personally familiar but not new images. So those are images uh, that the monkey has seen through our training, but they don't mean anything to him in like real life. Yeah, so, that, uh, so the idea is that maybe we would see something that is specific to personally known material. Um, and the a hypothesis that we had is that hippocampal cells would show more multimodal activity than the cortical cells. Uh, so this is our result in the, um, I mean the first set of results, and that we didn't find much difference between the two brain areas. We had visual cells, auditory cells, and bimodal cells, but the number of cells was uh, very similar. And even though we did have auditory cells and bimodal cells, we actually never found at the cellular level any correspondence between the visual identity and the vocal identity. And that became the uh, title of our paper, which is uh, uh, Independent Neuronal Representation of Facial and Vocal Identity in the uh, Monkey Hippocampus and Inferent Temporal cor Cortex. So uh, unlike what Rodrigo showed yesterday, none of our cells would respond to the voices in the same way that they responded to the faces. But that said, uh, there's still some lots of things that were interesting in the visual parts of the stimuli. So here I'm showing um, responses of the cells um, in the hippocampus in the and infertile cort cortex uh, to uh, monkey and human faces. So we found cells that categorize stimuli at the uh, um, that responded to the stimuli at a category level with cells that preferred monkey faces, cells that preferred uh, human faces, cells that preferred some type of uh, voices uh, also. And so I think what's interesting is that even though the monkeys didn't have to do anything in the task, it was just like passive viewing, the responses that we had, we could still categorize along the stimulus dimensions. And those are just uh, individual examples. Uh, so this is an example of a cell that responds to the monkey faces. And we can uh, do a principal component analysis and get this uh, cluster. This is two objects. And uh, um, this is a, so actually, this is actually looking, I didn't realize that your cells were not that uh, selective, but this looks a lot like the kind of cells that uh, you showed. So this is a cell that responds to two individuals in our set. Um, and uh, we can 
cluster that. Uh, here it responds to only of the two, uh, to only two monkeys, and we can also uh, see this at the uh, with the PCA um, analysis. Uh, here is one ultra spy. So Simon, that one is for you. <laughs> we only found like one cell that really had a uh, high ultra sparse representation. So this thing doesn't really mean anything to you, but for the monkey, it's actually the sort of like rigid leash with uh, which we take the monkeys out, the, the pole, right? <laughs> and, uh, and that was quite robust. See, what, what is the second green bar? What, what happens at this time? Oh uh, no! It's it's the uh, sorry. So, so uh, this is not spikes. It's just the offset, right? So onset, so offset. But yeah, some yeah yeah, yeah yeah. I agree. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't know. What offset, yeah yeah. It's the offset. Yeah. It's the offset. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, and if we use yeah. Sorry, I might have missed a step. You have a slide without the hypothesis. And then I think you said we didn't find that. Mm. And now I'm seeing this. Right, so what we didn't find was the uh, uh, correspondence between uh, visual stimulus and uh, voice. So what we thought we'd find would be the, a cell that encodes you know, Sylvia and then would also respond when Sylvia says something. Yeah. We never got that. So we got cells that responded to Sylvia, but then never responded to Sylvia's voice. So they were specific to your image? But, but yeah, awesome. absolutely. Okay. So it was not cross-modal. And so this illustrates kind of uh, um, I mean, and also the, vi the auditory uh, responses were really less rich than the visual responses. Mm -hmm. So this is an analysis using all the cells uh, doing a principal uh, component analysis in which we input all the responses to the cells to all the stimuli. And what we can see is that even in the hippocampus, we can actually parse the uh, objects from the faces, and this is the voice. And uh, um, it's better in T, in, uh, um, in the um, uh, inferior temporal cortex, but uh, it's kind of similar in both uh, structures. So I think the bottom line here is that we do have a representation of the uh, social stimuli, the faces, that is spontaneously represented in the hippocampus as a category in the same way as in the cortex. Um, but uh, we didn't find this multimodal thing that would actually show that there is a invariant response uh, as uh, was shown in the, uh, in the human. Uh, I think that so what it also shows is that there is a, a representation of social information in the hippocampus. It's also corroborated by um, a paper which um, was done in the, um, with fMRI in which they showed strong activity to uh, uh, faces. And uh, uh, so I think it's actually people have more focused on like place representation uh, or um, in, uh, in the hippocampus, but not really uh, try to see whether there is a representation of uh, social categories. And uh, uh, our work uh, together with this one uh, shows that there is and that may be uh, able, uh, enabling you to make those complex associations like uh, Jennifer Aniston at the White House. Uh, okay, so uh, um, as a bottom line, what I wanted to say was that uh, you know everything was gathered in the monkey, and was it a good model? And then what um, I think we can um, say is that we can learn a lot. Um, from uh, uh, the differences and the similarities. And one thing is that when I started this work, uh, there is not much work actually done with human, with uh, human cell signal recordings. And all this work came after. And now that this work is, uh, uh, is there, we can actually look at uh, specific uh, whether there are uh, differences. And uh, with respect with that last part of the talk, we are within the visual uh, domain, there is uh, uh, actually quite a lot of things that look similar. But one thing that was uh, that uh, Rodrigo and I, that emerged from discussion like at this is that, uh, for example, latencies of responses, and we talked a bit uh, about it yesterday, is that latencies of responses are very different in <coughs> the uh, uh, monkey from the human. And uh, uh, that's an interesting thing to know in that um, 
how we can interpret these uh, differences might tell us something about what makes us uh, unique. So I'm not showing the latencies here, but it's true that... So, huh? But roughly what is the... Right, so in the human, the latencies are 300 milliseconds, and yeah. in the monkey, it's 150. Both so in cortex and hippocampus? So, no, cortex is uh, 120. This is about, yeah. This was also the case for this one very cycle here? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank.